She let people know her feelings. And although it's very likely that she came down here to visit when Mrs. Biddle came to see the sons in school, and we know that she came down here later in her life to, to assist William Biddle and his wife, Susan Dayton Ogden Biddle, with their family, and we know that she went faithfully to church, but she also was not very pleased with the means by which you got to church. If you can put yourself back in that time period, the early part of the 19th century, it certainly couldn't have been convenient to go anywhere from this island. It would have been heavily wooded. There would have been no roads as we know them. There could have been a very uh, hard clay or very muddy clay road at different times of the year. There was a parish on this site, on this eastern shore, Trinity Episcopal Parish, but it never had a church. It never had a building of its own. The people in that parish met in homes. As a matter of fact, during one period in our history, there were four or five clergy who either lived here permanently or had summer homes along this eastern shore. They sometimes referred to this as Apostles Row. Well, if you didn't attend services in a private home, and those were not quite as complete, there were no con uh, baptisms or confirmations, it wasn't quite the same as attending a formal church, you might have gone across the island to St. John Church, another Episcopal church. That existed from 1850 forward. That church stood at the corner of West Road and McCarty Road, which today we know as Church Road. To get to that church, you must realize again you had to get on a horse or in a carriage or in some sort of vehicle, go through the woods, over the roads, to the services, and return. There were occasions when St. John didn't have a rector, in which case you might journey across to Truago, Truaxton, today we call it Trenton, to services at St. Thomas Church. You had the same ceremony getting there, only to get to church there, you also had to take this vehicle down to the end of the water, get in a boat, go across, be met by some other carriage, go off to church, and then repeat all this when you returned. On some occasions when perhaps St. Thomas had a rector and St. John didn't, the rector made this little ceremonious trip over. Sometimes it reversed and they, the clergy went there. It simply was not convenient to go to church, but Lizette did go. She was a firm believer and she did believe, she did make the effort. It was for all of these reasons that she left this money for the building of a chapel. <clears throat> In 1867, the Biddle brothers engaged an architect to design a chapel for this site. The architect was Gordon Lloyd. He was trained in England. He was very well known in the area. He also lived in Detroit at times. He had vacationed down here himself. The Biddles knew him. He was not unknown. As a matter of fact, there are two other houses on this island that he did build, or design, I should say, both on East River Road. One you can identify with the trefoil design, much like this chapel, and the other is a very plain stone farmhouse. The church that he designed was built, as we would say today, with materials on hand, and that, of course, was the wood. The very first service in here was held in the spring of 1868 and the church was consecrated on July 9 of 1868. The Right Reverend Samuel McCoskery came down from Detroit for the consecration, and he came down on the Island Queen, which was the ferry boat that brought people down to vacation. At that very first service, there would have been in place the very plain wooden cross you see this morning on the altar. That cross since has had a couple of holes drilled through it. At one point it had a crucifix attached to it. More recent time that was. It has since been removed and restored to its original form. At that service also, this kneeler would have been in place. There also is a reading stand that stands in the vestibule on the way to the fireside room. 
all three pieces would have been done by James Biddle, who enjoyed working in wood. I like to think that that cross came from an oak tree that stood right here. He had donated this land for the church, and because the funds that were left, although they were an impressive sum for a woman of that beginning at that time, it would not have built the chapel. <clears throat> so both William Biddle and other parishioners did contribute additional funds in order to have the church built. The windows in this church are really very interesting. The one behind me over the altar is a Tiffany window. It was installed and dedicated in 1898 on the 30th anniversary of the opening of this church. It's given in memory of Susan Biddle. It was installed, or I should say purchased and given by her son, who by then was a general. In the back of the chapel, there is a plaque dedicated to Susan for the many years of service she gave to the church and for making melody unto the Lord. The window to my left, which is a St. Elizabeth window, is another gift of the Biddle family. It's dedicated to Anne Biddle Copland in the early days the Lord lighted that window with sunshine, etc. And then we built a church hall, and that blocked out the sunlight. So now we must light it mechanically. The organ that was used at the very first service also came from the Biddle home, the William Biddle home up the road. It was Susan's parlor organ. She remained as an organist for quite some time. In 1880, another organ was brought in. I have reason to suspect it was a reed organ, but I'm still researching that, I'm not sure. That organ was given by Elizabeth Burry, who was the daughter of one of the clergy who lived along here, the Reverend Richard Burry. The early part of this century, from 1937 to about 1982, there was an organ that sat back here again a very small organ, that was given to the church by the Leonard-Davis-Berner family. And yes, the Verners had a lovely summer home down here. That house does still exist, they simply don't live in it today. That organ almost outlasted itself. <clears throat> It reached the point where there were no repair parts for it any longer, and the organist was never sure whether she was going to get through the wedding march, and so it was retired. Then we had an organ that stood right here. Again, it was a home organ. It had come from the home of our former Handel choir director, Nancy Hazlett. When Nancy and her husband returned east, the organ was brought over here. It had been her home organ. And it had, as a matter of fact, a beautiful cover on it at one time that was designed and executed by the daughter of parishioners, Tom and Barbara Woodward. In 18, or I knew I would do that, in 1988, on our 120th anniversary, we dedicated the organ that you see today. That organ was built specifically for St. James Church by Charles Ruggles of Olmstead Falls, Ohio. I trust it will be a long time before there is another organ installed in this church. The student lamp up here was dedicated at the same time. It dates to the period of 1860, so it was an appropriate acquisition. We had hoped to get away from that modern lighting device. That didn't work. The student lights did not give off enough um, illumination. That student lamp was dedicated at that time to my father-in-law, Michael Retour, and although he certainly didn't make that lamp, he was a metal craftsman himself, and it seemed to be appropriate. On that same anniversary, there was a new plaque installed on the outside of the chapel, correcting an error that had stood for 40 years. Unfortunately, and certainly innocently, the original plaque identified our benefactor as Elizabeth Ford Denison, which is a reversal of those two names. The other windows in this church, the three at the side and the one back here behind me, 
the one in the, the east wall were all installed in the 1940s, probably 47, 48. The one in this back corner has a, an as, a, assortment of musical instruments on it. It was dedicated to Helen Harkcastle, whom I understood was in the chorus for uh, the choir for quite some time. The window on my right is dedicated to Robert Lee Stanton. The Stantons were very, very supportive of St. John Church and eventually of St. Jane. They also have a direct lineage to the McCombs who originally purchased this island, and the family does still exist on the island. The east window was put in following World War II dedicated to the 11 men who were named beneath it on a flag who gave their lives during that war. 